Welcome, Welcome to, to Sam Culture. Oh, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have an intro. Really warm in here. Welcome to STEM Culture Podcast. Today we're talking with Miguel Perez and his experience as a first-generation Mexican-American graduate student. Miguel is passionate about redefining diversity in STEM as an advantage, not only a challenge. This episode goes out to all the first-generation Pokemon out there. Don't press B. Today, I, Danny, and Miguel chat about who might identify as a first-generation student, the advantages and challenges, some advice, and finally how to support first-gen students. Hi, everyone. We're here with Miguel Lopez, and I'm Danny. Now, Miguel is from the, uh, the Ohio State University, and he's a fourth year PhD student in biomedical sciences. And he's here to chat with us about uh, his experiences as a first gen uh, graduate student. So hi, Miguel. Hi, Danny. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Doing well. Doing well. Busy week. So the reason we, we had gotten in contact originally is because we had kind of been chatting on Twitter, you and me, about kind of the podcast and our goal to really learn more about other people, especially kind of minoritized students in STEM. And so we were wondering, um, kind of besides that, what was your impetus for being on an in STEM episode? Yeah, so one of the main reasons I reached out to you through Twitter uh, was I, I think I stumbled across one of your tweets. You know, I found it very interesting. So I can, you know, I started clicking and found out about the STEM Culture Podcast. I thought that was a, it's a very unique podcast. It's by grad students, for grad students. I thought the premise was very exciting. And, and I thought to myself that this could be a, a very great uh, vehicle to essentially begin a conversation that I've been having with a lot of my peers, a lot of my colleagues about what it really means when we say, uh, you know, diversity in STEM. Mm -hmm. um, last year, I did a one-year professional development program with the Yale Ciencia Academy. It's a professional, it's an NIH-funded professional development program, and they really stress science communication. So since then, I've done uh, a couple of outreach events, essentially trying to connect and make science more accessible to those communities that have traditionally been excluded from science. And throughout this process, I, I found out that when, when, when we say uh, URM, and when we say it in the context of science, it can sometimes be a little confusing, uh, especially because there are so many international students in STEM. So, so I think, the, you know, beginning and having a conversation of what it means uh, when, we, when we talk about diversity in STEM, uh, what, do we, what do we want to achieve by increasing representation of traditionally uh, underrepresented groups in STEM? Uh, and, and these would be, uh, for example, you know, the African-American students, um, Latino, Hispanic students, Native students, um, women right? There's not a lot of women in STEM, uh, especially in leadership positions. So, so in, in, in just beginning to have that conversation, uh, I thought this would be a great way to kind of begin that. Yeah, and then just for our listeners, URM stands for underrepresented um, minority. So often Correct. referring to minoritized students uh, in whichever way they are minoritized. And like you were mentioning, there's, there's a lot of ways that people can feel like they're not included especially in STEM. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, and you had wanted to speak on kind of first generation students in particular. So could you share with us what first generation means and who can be a first generation student? Sure, um, absolutely. So first generation students are, are defined as um, basically neither parent uh, having earned a bachelor's or a four year degree. Um, and really anybody can be a first generation student as it doesn't really matter whether or not you're part of a underrepresented minority group. It, it, it basically just dictates if you are uh, the first person in your family to go to college. Um, so it's very simple in that sense. Uh, I myself am a first generation college attendee. I was the first student in my family to go to college. Uh, meaning I was the first person in my family to apply to college, to fill out the FAFSA, and to kind of handle all the bureaucracies that come with 
attending a post-secondary um, educational institution. So one of the reasons why I thought uh, I, I wanted to talk about the first generation aspect is that it's a very unique experience. And um, for those of you that are listening and that are first generation college students, well, we, we will highly likely have had shared experiences um, as, as you went through undergraduate. But uh, in terms of what it means to, to when, when we talk about first generation college students, and, and how they um, affect, you know, or increase diversity at the college level in STEM fields, um, they, they overlap greatly, right? Um, generally a lot or a majority of first generation college students are from URM communities, and a lot of them are from, um, for example, low socioeconomic status families. So, so that exposure to um, college, that exposure to university education, is is novel and can sometimes pose some challenges for those students yeah someone so my mom went um she did her master's and applied to a phd program and so i felt much more prepared than i think a first generation student might have because when i was applying to grad school and even to college i was able to ask her every step of the way you know what to expect um and i think it would have been I know it would have been much harder if I hadn't had that. Absolutely. So in terms of kind of your, your experience as a first generation student, how do you think that's affected your contribution to and experience of graduate school? So I, I'm a, I guess a two time first generation college student. I was the first person to go to, to uh, college and the first person to go to graduate school. I'll be the first person to, to earn a, a doctor degree in my family. Um, my, my siblings uh, have kind of beat me to it, so uh, two of my siblings have already earned um, their master's. One is oh. uh, earned his master's in uh, criminal justice, and, and my sister just recently graduated with a, a master's in music. So oh, nice. I kind of paved the way for them and, and, and kind of bestowed upon them some of the tools, some of the tips that I've learned as an undergraduate and graduate student. Um, but really specifically for graduate school, I think, you know, we, we kind of face some of the same obstacles um, that, that first generation students face in undergraduate. Uh, but some of the kind of most important ones or the ones that, that really spoke out and, and I, I was able to pinpoint was that if you're the first person to attend graduate school and in and, and pursuit of an advanced degree, uh, you know, you, you often will find yourself feeling like everybody around you, your peers, uh, knows something that you don't, right? And it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, and and what, what I mean by that is that if you don't know something, right, you should ask. But, but then if you ask, then you kind of reveal that you're kind of new at this, right? Uh -huh. uh, and that's something that, that I struggled with a bit. Um, I kind of, I was able to work my way through undergraduate without a tremendous amount of help. I mean, I did have a good support system once, um, once in undergrad, but in graduate school, it's, it's a little, it's tougher. You know, it's more difficult. There are a lot of uh, more, there are more unwritten rules in graduate school that you, that you learn from either uh, peers or, or family or mentors. Um, but I think that idea that you feel like, you know, everybody gets it, everybody has it figured out, but you don't was one of the biggest challenges. Uh, but also, I think for me in particular, and, 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 and I can only speak uh, about my experience, but I know from, from my peers, my colleagues, they speak about having a constant uh, self-doubt or, or negative thinking. Um, and, and this uh, academically is known as imposter syndrome. Mm. And it's very prevalent, not just in first generation students, but really any student that feels uh, like they um, don't have a sense of belonging in graduate school yeah. for whatever reason. So imposter syndrome is, is a very real um, thing and it, it, it can be um, subtle and it can also sneak up on you. And essentially, essentially for those that, that aren't familiar, uh, perhaps are not familiar with imposter syndrome, but it's this feeling 
that you uh, you know snuck in that that somebody had had a, there was an accident and and you were accepted into graduate school by mistake and that you are you know barely getting through and but that one day you're going to be discovered as an imposter um, so this is something that we create you know in ourselves uh, for 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 mostly um, because of our experience in graduate school, but, but it really is something that can be definitely inhibiting to your progress uh, as a graduate student, as you work through your program. Uh, and it's one thing that I found very challenging as an undergrad that I was able to overcome, but definitely as a graduate student, because it was a, I mean, a hundred percent completely new world and, and was very different than my, than my bachelor's degree. Can I ask what worked for you to help you get over that feeling of imposter syndrome? So the one thing that I would say is that you never really get over it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and what helped me uh, was a number of things. One thing that, that really helped me is seeking out mentors and kind of looking, for, looking to them for advice at, um, to, to how to progress, how to you know, make that next move in, in my career. Uh, but I think what really helped from my mentors is knowing that they still felt the, the, the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I have two really good female professors as my mentors, you know, and they tell me, they, they, they say, yes, I, I feel that when I walk into the room and I'm the only female. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's still there. So it's, it's reassuring for up and coming scientists to see that, hey, you know what, this is something that you just have to deal with. You know, it, yeah. it particularly affects first generation students uh, uniquely because, you know, the, you, you're, this is completely new to you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also um, at the same time for underrepresented minority students, right, URM students, uh, it affects them because they don't generally see people like them around them, right, and, it's, and, yeah. and, and, and or in, in faculty positions. So again, really kind of bolstering that that idea that they don't belong and and i think that's what helped me a lot is is relying on mentors for advice finding a sense of belonging and in the way that i did it uh and, and a lot of my peers did it is by finding some sort of organization uh, a sense of community on campus that that will help you through those tough times because graduate school is incredibly hard and it's it's hard for everybody, you know, and I didn't realize that then, but I know now that, you know, it's hard for everybody. Mm -hmm. But because, uh, you know, some of my majority peers, their parents or their friends or, or their, their family have already gone to graduate school, they know that this challenge is temporary and, and they'll, you know, they're bound to get over it. Mm -hmm. But for somebody that's never done it before, it can seem like an insurmountable wall. Yeah. And, and that's the difference. So, so I think finding community and relying on mentors is critical uh, to really try to be proactive about the imposter syndrome. Yeah. And I think too, if you're able to find that community and then share with each other, if you have that safe space with that community, sharing with each other, like, Hey, I, I, I feel like I don't do this well, or like, I'm going to fail on this next thing. I know that's definitely helped, helped me and my friends as well. But yeah, you're right. If you don't have that community as a first generation student or that support, it becomes much, much harder. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. Absolutely. And so you'd mentioned some of the, the challenges um, that you've experienced, but what about some of the advantages? So, so yes. Yeah, so yeah, there's, there's definitely challenges and, and I've experienced them a lot. You know, we've all kind of gone through them. Uh, one of some of the advantages that I have really just recently kind of realized that First generation college students, um, URM students experience or, or have when, when approaching graduate school is, uh, there, there are a couple, but two of my, my top ones that I, that I thought of are that, so, so me personally, when I was growing up, I'm, I come from a low uh, SES or socioeconomic status family. Uh, that means that we didn't have much, right? We had limited resources. I attended a public school that had limited funding and when you are exposed to these uh, lack of resources, when you have to live and, 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 and survive and thrive in these types of environments, you learn to become very resourceful. Uh, 
right? So one of the arguments that I always have about, you know, well, why should we care about diversity in STEM? Why, why, why does it matter? Um, and, and the one thing that, that I argue back or my, my counter argument is there have been things that I've had to figure out, figure out on my own because of my lived experiences. And one thing that one of my mentors said uh, is that um, when you have scarcity, uh, when, you have, when you lack resources, uh, that is the best fuel for creativity. And for anybody that's done science, for anybody that's done any type of science, one of the most important things about really moving forward on a project is how creative can you get? Mm -hmm. you know, how, how imaginative can you get in trying to answer and trying to design a particular assay that's going to give you that information that you need to make the conclusion and, and kind of complete that story um, that you're trying to answer. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, resourcefulness is very critical and it's a benefit, uh, especially from first generation URM students. Um, and also uh, one of the things that I found was beneficial for me was the kind of persistence that 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 I picked up along the way through high school you know it was it was challenged and uh, through undergraduate but the idea that this is something that's new this is something that, that none, nobody in my family's ever done before uh, but just kind of chugging along right and, 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 and struggling through um, trying to ask for help when I could but but the persistence uh, and the grit that first generation students bring uh, is really what you need and, and, and really is very valuable for graduate education. Uh, I would say that that uh, quantitated about 80 to 90 percent of the things you're going to do in graduate school will not work. They, the, the experiment will not work. Uh, it will not give you the information you need in a lot of graduate school that I found is troubleshooting and, and trying to figure out the best way that will work. I think one of the uh, one of the important parts about graduate school is being persistent and understanding that um, a lot of things aren't going to work, uh, especially the first time. And having that experience, having that lived experience of of pushing through, of uh, being you know just diligent with your work, is is just another advantage that first generation college students and, um, and URMs really bring um, as candidates to graduate school. So, so they, that's really what makes them uniquely qualified to take on these tough questions in science. Yeah, and especially too, I remember um, you know, moving from undergrad to grad school, I, I had never really struggled and struggling for the first time in grad school feels awful. And it took me a long time to figure out how to struggle and not let it, and not let it derail me. Um, so if you have that grit already when you come through, um, yeah, I think that's absolutely an advantage. That's very interesting. So one of the things that that I um, that I did want to speak about, um, since we're you know while we're still on this topic, is this idea of uh, of um, you know what do first generation URM students, what do they bring to the table when it comes to graduate school? I realized not too long ago, actually, I, uh, I realized this about a year and a half into my, my, my training was that there was a lot, there were a lot of things that I did as I was growing up, a lot of things that I learned, a lot of troubleshooting that I did that I was able to apply to my technical to my techniques, to my technical abilities as a graduate student. Um, and had it not been for this, these lived experiences, you know, I may have not overcome those challenges um, as quickly. Mm -hmm. so, so essentially, one of, the, one of my main goals, um, as I talk to you, as, as I continue to really do science outreach, is making the point that under, underrepresented minority scientists, URM scientists, URM STEM students are successful in science, not in spite of their, their challenges and their obstacles in their life, uh, but truly are successful in science 
because of those challenges, mm -hmm. right? Those lived experiences have give the, given them um, such novel perspective about problems and problem solving that make, it makes them incredibly, incredibly um, effective scientists. Uh, and, and I think that's the conversation we're not having. Mm -hmm. I often will hear that, you know, we should care about diversity in STEM or, or diversity in higher education because it's the right thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. We should care about diversity in STEM or in higher education because it addresses a systemic exclusion of these groups for decades, right, for centuries. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, those are all good reasons to care about diversity in STEM and in higher education. But um, I think a stronger argument can be made that if we don't get as many perspectives and as many different um, students solving the scientific problems, uh, I think that, that that is the biggest disservice to the scientific enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. So we're holding ourselves back if we don't do this. And, and I think that's, that's the conversation we should be having. It's all well and good to be fair and to address discrepancies and disparities, but, but really this is what we need to do as a country to ensure that we stay um, as a top tier research country. Um, and, and that, that is going to, that is going to take active um, recruitment of talented students from all different walks of life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's um, the business world really has a market in terms of how they've studied this. Um, they've shown uh, that the more diverse and more inclusive that their companies are, the more money they make. Yeah, STEM needs to get on board because not only is it, you know, like you were saying, kind of the morally right thing to do, but uh, it makes sense because we're going to do better science. That's just a fact. Absolutely. So we talked about how uh, you found that being a first-gen student um, has affected your experiences in graduate school, but how, have you, how has that affected your experience outside of academia? Um, so outside of academia, academia, going to graduate school has really been an, an interesting and, a, and sometimes a little scary uh, in terms of how it's changed me as an individual. As the first person to go to graduate school for my family, um, I have gone to school for longer than anybody in my family. Um, I, I forget what year of schooling I'm in, but I don't am, count, don't count. <laughs> yeah, I am um, by years in school definition, uh, the most educated person in my family. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that, that is a little difficult to navigate and, and perhaps, you know, some of your listeners will be able to relate to this, but kind of navigating those two worlds of this is what you do in the academy. You know, this is how you think in the academy. This is how you approach a problem in the academy. Um, and having that world coexist with your, you know, family uh, that, that may not have ever and has never had that exposure to the academy. So, so I think being comfortable with my identity, uh, not only as a scientist, but as a Mexican-American scientist, uh, somebody that has lived a, a very different, um, you know, upbringing than, than most of my peers in the academy and, and has experienced a lot of different things in the academy than, than most of my family members. Mm. But through, through, you know, throughout the years, I've, I've grown to take advantage of the education and, and everything that I've been exposed to in, um, in the academy and, and, and try to bring it back to my community. I think that was one of the ways that I was able to consolidate that seemingly kind of um, contrary views. Uh, so, so a lot of the information that I that have acquired throughout my education now, I have tried to make it more accessible, right? Make it less jargony, and, and really try to communicate that to any and all family members that want to listen. So, so I really enjoy that aspect. Is kind of merging the the academy with my community 
-hmm. and trying to make the science that I do in the academy more accessible to the community that I come from um, so they can also benefit right from that knowledge mm -hmm. so I think I think that's the way that I've tried to consolidate those two and reconcile that conflict it's it's worked for me that's been one of the biggest challenges absolutely um, about being first generation in graduate school but outside of academia I was curious when you bring kind of your science back to, me, to your community, are you, are you speaking in Spanish to them or is it English or is it a mix? Uh, it's actually a mix. So uh, I particularly don't really have a lot of experience with doing science in Spanish, uh, something that, that I really want to, to try to improve and, and, and hopefully try to find an opportunity where I can maybe do research abroad uh, in okay. a Spanish country. I, I think that would be very very interesting but but when I but no generally when I take the science or I try to bring something back um, to my community to my family to my my friends uh, it's it's generally in a mixture of either um, Spanish and English a combination of the two uh, if and I'll try to I'll try to describe it in Spanish but then if there's a scientific word I don't know in Spanish I'll revert I'll revert to English yeah <laughs> yeah I have um me and my friend um, Maria Elise, we we both have the same issue where we we've never really spoken about our science in Spanish before, and so when we've tried, we yeah we absolutely get tripped up on like well I don't know how to say that word in Spanish because it's a science word I've only ever said it in English so uh, yeah so I was just curious about that. So what advice do you have for first gen students in grad school and beyond? Um, so I think one of the biggest uh, one of the most important things about graduate school and succeeding in graduate school uh, from the perspective of a URM first generation student is that one of the only ways that I was able to really push through the tough times and, and get through candidacy um, was having a, a, a support system. And this can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Uh, for me, it, it meant finding a student organization that I really connected to that was composed of both um, undergraduate and graduate uh, URM STEM students that were going through some of the similar experiences uh, throughout their respective career trajectories. Um, this organization is called SACNIS. Uh, some of your listeners might be familiar with SACNIS, but SACNIS stands for um, Society for the advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in science. It is the largest minority uh, STEM organization in the country. Um, and it just, uh, I think, turned 45 last year. Oh, amazing. So, yeah, so it's been around for a while. Um, there is a chapter at The Ohio State University that I actually helped establish back in 2014. And, and it was this organization um, Actually, it was this organization that introduced the idea of being a doctor. When, uh, when I helped establish the organization, I was actually a research assistant, so I was a technician. And I had been a technician for about two years at that point um, until I kind of stumbled across this organization. And through this organization, I was able to go to their national conference. And for that year, I think it was in DC, and this was in 2015. Uh, their, their national conference is every uh, October, November, and it's about a three to four day conference that kind of brings together science, um, culture, and identity. Uh, one of the most unique conferences that I have ever been to. But at this conference, it was the first time that I was actually able to see Mexican-American Native scientists being amazing, really excelling in their careers, being amazing and doing amazing, amazing, amazing research. And I remember actually very distinctly that it was during this conference that I realized that I could also do this. Um, I, was a, I was a research assistant at the time and I was really enjoying my work. Uh, I was having fun in the lab. I, I was really kind of really, you know, just living the best life in the lab. But that was it, I really hadn't considered uh, you know, pursuing any sort of uh, advanced degree until um, I went to the conference, was introduced to such amazing people, 
the transformative conference. I came back, I believe it was um, the first week of November that I came back in 2015. And when I came back, I was so inspired, so motivated that I, I took the GRE uh, in about a month. I got all my letters of recommendation in about a month. I applied to all the different schools and started graduate school about six months later. Oh, wow. So, so it was this organization not only that inspired uh, you know, my, my passion of science and, and, and introduced the idea of, of getting a PhD, but it was the, the chapter at Ohio State that was there through the tough times. So that's the number one thing that I would recommend to anybody, and especially uh, first-gen URM students going into graduate school, I think that the first thing you should do is search for a community. This can be a student organization. It can be a uh, faith-based organization. Um, some people are uh, you know, members of Greek letter organizations are, are good as well, but find a community, find a, a, a group of people um, that I refer to as your squad yeah, uh, that, yeah. Will, that, that will be there through the good times, through the bad times, that will be there to, to show you that it is going to get really hard. It is going to become very difficult. You are going to be asked to do things that not many people are asked to do. And that is solve a question that has never been solved before. Mm -hmm. Right? That is, that is, it's, it's really difficult to really wrap your head around. You are creating knowledge yeah. for others to consume. Right? So, so I think that really establishing yourself in a community that you feel supported, you feel loved, you feel held accountable, I think is also important. Uh, and, and I think that would probably be uh, the top recommendation that I would have. Um, uh, but close second and third would be uh, one, um, definitely prioritize self-care. So exercising, um, I, know, I know you do, uh, I believe, weightlifting, is that right? Uh, powerlifting, yeah. Powerlifting, right? Yeah. Um, so exercising, keeping your body in motion is very, very helpful. Meditation, hobbies of any sort, kind of taking that time away from the lab, away from science is, is important. And then uh, the last bullet point that I think I wanted to mention was being proactive about your mental health. Yeah. Uh, coming from a... Uh, a minority group um, where mental health isn't really isn't really discussed. It's, it's not really prioritized. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be a little bit difficult to really begin that process. Looking for a counselor, looking for somebody that really matches your needs. Yeah. But but being proactive about your mental health is just as important as going to your you know primary care physician. It yeah. really honestly is going to be uh, one of the best investments of your time. Is, is going to see somebody, going to talk to somebody about anything. It really doesn't matter. Uh, initially, it doesn't matter. You just need to have a way, have an outlet for what's yeah. going to be going through your head, you know? Yeah. And something I, I learned recently, you don't even have to have something quote unquote wrong, you know, but ha having someone that's completely outside of your everyday life that can see whatever you're talking about from a totally different perspective is so incredibly helpful. Even if you just want to talk to them about like, oh, work was crappy today. Oh, why was it crappy? And then you explain and they're like, well, that sounds like you're making progress, even though it's hard. Like having, having that, you're speaking to my soul. <laughs> At STEM Culture Podcast, we often ask our guests, um, especially on our instem episodes how how they think that the culture could be changed to make it better um within stem and stem careers so uh for you um you know how can graduate schools help first gen students and first gen urm students be successful i think one of the most important things that graduate schools and, and individual graduate programs can do is making sure that all the resources are very clearly explained, um, letting graduate students know exactly where to go in case they're, they're looking for the, the community that, I, that we spoke about um, for, you know, 
uh, exercise facilities, mental health services. So I think that's, that's the, the initial thing is to make sure that any and all resources that are there for the students are, are easily accessible, clear and concise um, and, and are made available to students. Um, in addition to that, I think graduate schools can also uh, do a better job at discussing some of these very kind of taboo topics that I think we need to be having a conversation about. Um, and, and three of the main ones that, that I think would be beneficial in creating an environment that is welcoming, right, that is belonging to uh, traditionally uh, underrepresented groups uh, would be uh, having some sort of workshop or seminar or about uh, implicit bias, right? Mm -hmm. I think that would be a very good thing to discuss and talk about what does that mean? Yeah. Um, I think another topic that should be spearheaded in, in graduate programs is the idea of microaggressions, right? Yeah. Uh, what, what are these small, seemingly insignificant things? And, and let's look at the impact that they can have in an individual, right? Yeah. Um, and let's have those tough conversations. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, having a good idea of what it means to be culturally competent. Uh, so, yeah. so these are the main, these are, in my opinion, the three main things that graduate schools or, or graduate programs can, can take the lead on and, and, and have those discussions, have either a formal class where they discuss these, these things in an open and you know, receptive environment uh, so that people feel like, hey, you know what, this is, I'm not the only one feeling this, this is out, this is being talked about. Mm -hmm. And if there is some sort of misunderstanding or if there is some sort of uh, tension, then it's easier to, to have that follow-up conversation. Um, so, so I think those are some of the things that the graduate schools and graduate programs can, can focus on. Uh, making yeah. resources readily available and, and, and practice having these, these tough conversations about these very important topics. Absolutely. And having, having that be a conversation on purpose and being able to really feel like you're in a safe space to be like, you know, I, I don't understand what microaggressions are. And someone, you know, someone got mad at me the other day and, and being able to have that conversation helps so much. And just like you were saying, practicing and especially, and I, I love all those suggestions a lot because it, I think <laughs> in graduate school or in science and STEM, I think we often think maybe subconsciously or consciously that, oh, we're so rational, like we don't have biases. We absolutely do. We're human like everybody else. And being aware of your biases is really the, the first step in being able to be like, oh, well, whoops, like I'm having that feeling now. And so I can acknowledge it in my head and be aware. I love all those ideas a lot. Yeah. Does the Ohio State have a diversity center? The Ohio State University has many departments, and they do have an Office of Diversity and Inclusion, okay. which is uh, an office that is um, under, I believe, the provost, but is an academic-based office that its primary goal is to ensure that uh, URM students are properly supported so that they can attain, attain their degree. Um, so they're very concerned about making sure that they are academically supported. Um, and that's the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. There is also a multicultural center on campus, uh, which falls under, I believe, student life. Okay. And, and that more so deals with identity and, and kind of sometimes having these conversations of, of what it means to be um, Latino or, or Native or, you know, a, a woman in science. And some of these conversations are where the multicultural center will would actually be more involved. So, okay. so there are two. There are two entities on, on campus that, that do help with with um, with supporting those students. Have you ever gotten like? Do they put on events? Have you ever used any of their resources? Yeah, no. That we we actually have collaborated with ODI and MCC, and by we, uh, I mean the Ohio State Sackness chapter. Okay. Cool. We have we have done multiple events with both. Uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and the Multicultural Center um, in, in regards to how um, URMs uh, succeed in STEM. So, so we've, we've had speakers that we've brought on campus, uh, famous minority scientists that have done incredible things, speak to the students, and, and a lot of different like networking things, professional development things, 
Um, so yeah, we I like their programming. It's 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 very supportive. Uh, I think they have a tall order on their plate just because there are so many students on campus, and because there is a small percentage of minority students, it's a little difficult to to, to actually reach out to them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, cap and capture their attention, but but they do offer year-round programming um, on a variety of topics. ODI does a great job at at you know, putting on this this programming for for the students and MCC um, does does a really great job at at doing a cross cultural support. So in the multicultural center, there are um, intercultural specialists that maybe focus on the you know Latino community. Um, one would focus on the native community and they do a lot of cross collaborations, which I think uh, is beneficial. I mentioned you helped establish the SACNAS chapter at the Ohio, the Ohio State. How hard was that? It wasn't terribly hard to do the formal paperwork. Um, I didn't do the, the paperwork itself. Um, a previous Ohio State student did the paperwork and submitted it to the national organization and we got kind of a welcome kit. Okay. I think the I think the most difficult part was really increasing our presence mm -hmm. and and showing that we as an organization were effective. We we put on great programs and we could and and do act as that support community for these STEM students. Oh, so cool. we have been on campus since, like I said, 2014. So we are, I believe, starting our fifth year now, and our membership is strong. We we have over 35-ish active members that that generally come to to meetings, um, on you know monthly meetings. We have listservs that are in the hundreds. So we have grown to to really be a presence on campus, and the goal of the of the organization is to to really be that support system for the students that need it. Um, yeah. Both Professionally, personally, uh, we we are we really want to be there for for the students, right? So we want to yeah. see what we wish that we had back when we, the, the chapter was not uh was not there. Yeah, well, I really like that idea of having not only like the professional support but the personal, maybe cultural support in the same unit because having you know the diversity and inclusion office and then a separate multicultural center like that's great, but really the two are combined, aren't they? Right, exactly. Uh, yep, they are. They're they're intertwined. Yeah. Right? Um, how you identify yourself and how you feel about who you are in this environment in, at Ohio State, uh, a predominantly white environment, mm -hmm. it will will affect the way that you do ac academically. Will play a role in that. Um, yeah. And I think kind of having those two um, work together, I think, is very critical. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Miguel, before we kind of finish up, um, we wanted to know um, how can people follow up with you if they wanted to hear more about, about you and, and SACNAS and the Ohio State and your life? <laughs> uh, yeah, so the easiest way to follow up with me is, uh, um, as, as you uh, said before, I'm very active on Twitter. So you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my, um, my at name is, uh, it's M-I-G-Z and 614. Um, you can just search for me on Twitter. I'm definitely there. Uh, or you can also reach me via email. Email is actually a very good way to get a hold of me, actually probably the only way to get a hold of me, and that is Lopez, uh, my last name, L-O-P-Z dot one five four at OSU dot edu. Wonderful. And we'll, we'll link that to our show notes so it'll be easy for people to to follow up with you. Fantastic. We heard myself and Miguel chat about first generation students, about identity, advantages and challenges, advice and support. Thanks y'all so much for listening. Next time we'll be releasing part two of reviews, reviewers and rejections that we first released in season one, episode 11. Hear from Dr. Needy Bala and Dr. Bill Matthews about their peer review experiences. You can find us on all the socials when you search STEM Culture One Word po Podcast. And when in doubt, you can visit our website at stemculturepodcast.com for show notes, references, and information about our guests and contributors, and transcripts. To follow up with Miguel, you can find him on Twitter at Migs614. That's Migs, Miguel, I G Z, or Z, 614. Until next time, don't forget to consensually hug a grad student or at least buy them a coffee or a pumpkin spice chate, boba milk tea. Your chate. Chai latte. Yeah!